One of the things that uh, makes the study of H2 plus uh, simpler than for regular molecules is that it has only one electron. So what I want to do now is consider what happens when we move to more than one electron in a molecular setting. Now I've written out the uh, Hamiltonian that we would typically expect to find for you know some kind of diatomic molecule. This is in fact 4H2. So I should probably specify that over here. This is for H2 molecule, where we've got the kinetic energy of the electrons uh, represented here. These terms are ones that represent the attractive forces that uh, bind one electron, electron one, with the two nuclei, A and B. This would be the attractive Coulomb force for the other electron with the nuclei A and B. There is an, a repulsive Coulomb, attra uh, repulsive Coulomb force between the two electrons, and of course a repulsive force between the two nuclei. So this would be all of the terms that one would need to include in the Hamiltonian. Now, when we are talking about a diatomic molecule, uh, we're going to want to create our molecular orbitals by forming sums over atomic orbitals. So I want to explain a little bit the notation here. Uh, in this case, the alpha represents just some atomic orbital. So it could be a 1s orbital, or it could be a 2s orbital, or a 2p, or whatever it might be. So we're adding two of those together to make a bonding combination and subtracting them to make an antibonding combination. I should also mention that uh, we have to pay attention to the fact that all these electrons have intrinsic angular momentum. They have spin. So in fact, when we construct these wave functions, we're going to have to construct them as Slater determinants. And I won't uh, make this slide more complicated by adding a uh, picture of the Slater determinant, but I hope you'll recall what that is from our multi-electron atoms. Uh, but we're going to have to do the same thing here. So the whole idea is we're going to create a basis, if you will, of these linear combinations of atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals. We're going to make them anti-symmetric by expressing them as Slater determinants. And then we're going to do some kind of calculation, whether it's a variational calculation, a Hartree-Fox self-consistent field, uh, uh, approximation for this to actually calculate the outcomes of the energy levels and the orbitals or the molecular orbitals that would be formed for these different molecules. So it's really uh, an extension of what we did for multi-electron atoms um, using this machinery now that involves two nuclei as part of our uh, as part of our calculation. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I, I hope you'll appreciate that. I'm never going to ask you to calculate you know, the uh, result for uh, some diatomic molecule. What we're going to be more interested in, though, is what does the quantum states, what do the quantum states mean for these uh, molecules? All right, so one of the first things that we want to look at is uh, something to do, having to do with their symmetry. So we're going to be looking at the inversion symmetry of the orbitals that are formed in a diatomic molecule. Now remember that diatomic molecules, we're going to generally situate their nuclei on the z-axis. So there is a cylindrical symmetry to these molecules uh, of some kind or another. And we've seen already that in the H2 plus case, we have uh, a quantum number, lambda, that uh, basically tells us what kind of orbitals we create, whether it be sigma, pi, delta, or something higher. All right, so these are still going to be true uh, even when we're talking about uh, molecules with more than one electron um, involved in the bonding. So this inversion symmetry is going to have to be something that reflects something relevant for an object that has, if you will, this cylindrical symmetry. So what we're going to do is look at the inversion through the center of the molecule, which means we're going to take a point and, and I, I should have mentioned that we are mostly focusing in this uh, video on homonuclear diatomics. So the two atoms here are the same type of atom, A and B. Um, so the midpoint of their bond is going to be the center of the molecule. And so what we're going to be interested in is how does the wave function behave when you invert through that center? So in other words, does the wave function change sign when you go to the opposite side. All right, if the answer is no, that it stays the same sign, 
then we're going to say that these molecules, or that this state, has something called Garada, or G symmetry. The Garada is a German word uh, that uh, basically just indicates that it didn't change sign. All right, if the answer is yes, well, guess what? There's a German word for the opposite of Garada, and it's called Ungerade. So we say that it has U symmetry. All right, so this G and U refers to does the wave function change sign when you go through the center? All right, so let's see what this looks like. Okay, we'll draw some examples here. All right, let's suppose we have a sigma 2pz orbital. So this is a bonding orbital for sigma 2z. Now remember that uh, when we drew this out, okay, this is the z-axis going through the two nuclei. Okay, we had a large lobe that connected the two nuclei, and then we had smaller lobes that were sort of the vestiges of the pz orbitals that were used to form it. So if we use our coloring scheme, uh, we'll color this side for the positive lobe, uh, we'll color that purple, and for the two negative lobes on the outside, we'll do this. All right, the nodes that still exist here are ones that came from the original PZ orbitals that you were used to make up this molecular orbital. But what we're interested in is the inversion symmetry about the center of the molecule here. So as we look at this picture, what I want you to be able to see is that if I'm starting at a point way out here and I invert through this center, I will end up at a point over here. All right, well, this was a negative lobe of the, molecule, of the wave function, and the thing in the middle here is a positive lobe. So if I start out here and I end up here, I went from a negative to a negative, so I didn't change sign. If I start anywhere in the purple region here and invert through this center, I will still be in the purple region. So in other words, this is a case where we have no change in sign. So this orbital, as we have drawn it here, is something that would have G symmetry. Or uh, I guess another way to say it, I say symmetry. Um, inversion symmetry is also a property we refer to as parity. So this has G parity for this particular wave function. All right, let's look at the uh, pi star 2px orbital. Okay, so as another example. So we'll have pi star rising from the 2px orbital. So what would that look like? Well, once again, let me draw out this orbital. So we have our two nuclei here. And remember that when we drew this particular case, we end up with four lobes. And I'm drawing them a little skewed here because I want to emphasize the fact that we have an antibonding nodal plane in the middle here, in addition to the azimuthal nodal plane that we will always find in the case of a pi orbital. All right, so when we drew this case, I think these were the ones that were negative sign and, oops, and the positive lobes are these two. So I've got positive lobes here and here. I've got negative lobes here and here. All right, our point of inversion is the middle of the bond. So that's going to be a point right about here. So when I start over here and I invert through the bond, I'll end up over here, but I didn't change sign. If I start over here and invert through the middle of the molecule, I'll end up over here. I don't change sign. So once again, we find that this particular orbital has G parity or G symmetry. It does not change sign when we invert. All right. So this is uh, you know, a useful thing to know that sigma bonds, typically bonding, sigma bonding orbitals, have G symmetry. Pi antibonding orbitals have G symmetry. What about pi bonding orbitals? Well, remember, in the case of a pi bonding orbital, and I'll draw that out here, So here are two nuclei. We have one lobe up here 
we have one lobe down here. Um, when we color these to indicate the sign, this one is a positive lobe. The one on the bottom is a negative lobe. And we have our azimuthal plane still intact here. But now when we invert to the center of the molecule, if I start up here, I end up down here. I go from a positive part of the wave function to a negative part. And that's going to be true no matter where we are in the wave function. So in this particular case, this being a pi star orbital, I'm sorry, not a pi star, a pi bonding orbital, this has U symmetry or parity. And this will generally be true of pi bonding orbitals. This will generally be true of sigma bonding orbitals. They will have G symmetry, and pi star will have U symmetry, uh, sorry, G symmetry. What do you think will be true for sigma antibonding orbitals? Well, I hope you can guess that when we go from sigma bonding to sigma antibonding, we actually change the parity of these orbitals so that they have U symmetry. All right, what this means is that we can create a whole different labeling scheme for these orbitals. And so you will commonly see uh, these different schemes. So what I want to do is in order of increasing energy, I'm going to write out the ones using the scheme that we've already introduced. So we have sigma s, sigma star 1s, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s. Okay, and these are roughly an increasing energy. Um, sigma 2pz, sigma star 2pz, pi 2px, and I'll say 2px or y, there's two of them, they're, and they're degenerate, pi star 2px or y. All right, so with this labeling scheme, we're basically showing you not only the molecular orbital, indicating antibonding orbitals with stars, but also telling you what uh, atomic orbitals they came from. Now, when we go through this whole calculation, though, it doesn't really matter uh, how we constructed these orbitals to begin with. These are just an approximation to the actual orbitals in the molecule. So, in fact, these labels, while they are handy and they're useful at, uh, for smaller atoms, they're less useful for larger atoms. And so instead, what's better is to talk about the symmetry of these wave functions. That's the more important feature. So for this reason, what we tend to do is instead of using these labels, we use a different set of labelings. Okay, when we have a bonding sigma orbital, that's got G symmetry. I'm going to call this 1 because it's the very lowest energy sigma bonding orbital. Its antibonding, its corresponding antibonding orbital would be 1 sigma U. The 1s tell you that uh, they basically are related to one another in some sense. If they were simple LCAOs, then they would be based on the same set of atomic orbitals. Once you mix these things together, it's harder to say that, uh, but you can say that these two are related to one another simply because one has a, an antibonding nodal plane in the middle of that orbital. Okay, when we go to the next sigma orbital, we'll give it the label 2. So 2 sigma g for its bonding component, 2 sigma u for its antibonding component. Likewise, even when we go to ones that come from a, a p orbital, we will call this 3 sigma g and 3 sigma u. All right, now when we get to the pi orbitals, remember that the bonding one has u symmetry and the antibonding one has g symmetry. So now this will be 1 pi u for bonding and 1 pi g for antibonding. So we'll end up using these labels now uh, as much and more perhaps than the ones that indicate the parentage of the molecular orbital uh, in the first place. Now I want to spend a few uh, minutes talking about the energy levels that we get for these orbitals, for these molecular orbitals. So I'll remind you that uh, one of the results we got for H2 plus was that the energies could be written as the energy of the uh, fundamental orbital, and I'm, I'm going to call it E sub alpha. It is the energy of the atomic orbital that gave rise to the molecular orbitals. Plus, I'm going to have J, and I'm going to label this with alpha also, because it turns out the value of the Coulomb integral will change depending upon which orbitals you use. 
as will the exchange integral. So I'll label both of those with the, the orbital parentage, if you will. And then this will be divided by 1 plus or minus s, which also uh, depends upon those orbitals. So just to remind you, the Coulomb integral was essentially 1 over r plus the integral that was this orbital, uh, I'm sorry, located on the b atom, minus, minus 1 over r b, I'm sorry, the Coulomb integral has, this, has these on the same or, same atom. All right, so this is the Coulomb integral. It's the exchange integral that will have s over r plus phi alpha b minus 1 over rb phi alpha a. And then finally, the overlap integral is simply the overlap of these two atomic orbitals. All right, so with these definitions, um, I'll again remind you that uh, when r is small, the first term in these two things dominates, so it becomes very large and positive. Um, but they both have terms that will draw it to be negative. Uh, j actually becomes only slightly negative. k actually becomes significantly more negative. So when we draw what these energies look like, and this is what I'm really interested in getting to at this point, is we're going to draw a scale like this, and I'm going to put my energy of my atomic orbitals here. All right, so when we uh, add the j, so let's just add the j term first. I'm going to draw it like this. So we have e plus or minus is equal to the atomic orbital plus a term that is dependent upon the Coulomb integral and a term that is dependent upon the exchange integral. All right, so the first term, what it's going to do, um, if we're at a uh, internuclear distance that uh, corresponds to bonding, J is slightly negative there, so this is going to go down very slightly. But I want to point out that it doesn't go down equally because in one case I've got J sub alpha over 1 plus S alpha, and in the other case I have J sub alpha divided by 1 minus S sub alpha. S sub alpha is going to be some positive number. All right, so these will be slightly different from one another. So the energy will come down slightly, uh, but these will be slightly different. The k, uh, the exchange integral, is somewhat larger. And once again, when we have, and it's also negative at this point, at, uh, so what will happen is we'll end up with now a bigger difference that occurs now when we add the second term. So this is the full e sub plus or minus. So this is e plus and e minus. But the point of drawing this diagram is to show you that what typically happens is you have the two results of your molecular orbitals are more or less centered around the energy of the atomic orbitals that they're built from. All right, k is the thing that generates, uh, has the sort of larger effect on this energy spread. All right, but, um, but what happens basically is that you're going to split these two. So it's not exactly true that the average of these two energies will be the energy of the atomic orbital, but it's approximately true. And so we tend to, to draw it that way. Now I've introduced this because we're going to take this a step further in subsequent videos and talk about what uh, it looks like when we begin to consider the full set of energy levels that accrue for a homonuclear diatomic. But that's for, uh, uh, I guess, additional uh, discussion.